Kalila Harris for The Real News Network. Today we're going to be discussing a new report from the Brookings Institution on the devaluation of assets in the black community. We're joined today by Dr. Andre Perry, who's a David Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Welcome, Andre. Hi, how are you? I'm well. We're also joined by Associate Professor at Morgan State University, Dr. Lawrence Brown. Welcome, Lawrence. Hey, how are you? I'm well. All right, so let's dive right into this report. Um, Andre, will you talk a little bit about your team's approach to this research and why you thought it was important to take a look at the valuation of assets in black communities as compared to um, other communities housing evaluation writ large? Yeah, we do know that housing is a central feature of the American dream in that it, it somewhat um, secures a certain level of success, opportunity, and wealth. I mean, in this country, it's been consistently the most um, um, prominent way to uh, accumulate wealth over time. And in particular for black people, where 50% of our wealth is tied into housing, it becomes important that we maximize that asset. Um, but we also know that redlining, uh, racial covenants, and segregation have limited uh, our ability to purchase property in certain areas, also for us um, to get loans for uh, made it difficult for us to get loans in, in, in black neighborhoods. And so we do know that there's been um, a, a reduced price because of um, the, the, the problems associated with segregation, redlining, and racial covenants. Um, but we wanted to see the, ex to the extent to which um, crime, uh, education, um, um, and other neighbor and neighborhood factors and, 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 and housing factors contributed to that price. And what um, and how much did um, race impact the price? So we went about finding equivalent homes in black and, and white neighborhoods. We controlled for everything from how many, you know, how many bedrooms are in it in, on the home, the home size, a number of structural characteristics. We also control for education, crime, um, walkability, transportation, and a number of other factors. So before we controlled for those variables, we found that um, on average in the U.S. metropolitan area, um, homes in black neighborhoods are worth 50% less, um, they're, they're priced 50% um, less than white, uh, than their white um, counterparts. But after controlling for all those factors, education, crime, um, um, uh, various neighborhood amenities, we still found that, that housing prices were still worth 23% less than their white counterparts. And that equated to about 48,000 per home, um, which amounted to $156 billion in lost assets uh, across, the num uh, across the country. So it was a pretty stark find to, to, to see that the black, that black communities have lost $156 billion due to race and racism. So what do you say to folk who would offer if affluent black people decided to move into those communities that the valuation of those assets would be higher, right? So who is the person or who are the people who are determining what the value of those homes would be? Well, no, it, it's not necessarily the, the net worth of the people in the communities, but it is the concentration of blackness that impacts those communities. So if you're an, an upper um, middle class or upper class person, you're certainly going to get value um, by moving into a, a low income neighborhood in a sense of um, it, it'll, you, it'll be affordable for you. However, um, it is those properties are generally devalued, 
meaning that they're coming in below market rate. So you won't get as much money as you would if it was in a in a um, um, another neighborhood. But if you're if you're wealthy or middle income, you're probably going to get a get a, a home at a reduced price. Mm -hmm. But in terms of um, if, if you can sell it and get what it's really worth, then that that's where the problem comes in. Right. But it's the concentration of blackness that are that's devaluing per se the the, the price of homes in black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, that 48000 per person makes me think of uh, analysis like Ta-Nehisi Coates' mm -hmm. um, The Case for Reparations, right, and connecting to present-day ways in which black communities are um, having resources divested from them or economic barriers. And Lawrence, you've also done a ton of research on this phenomena here in Baltimore. You've coined the terms the black butterfly and the white L. Will you talk about implications of this data for Baltimore and what kind of policies might be able to be created to mitigate and remediate the disparities that we see? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And when I hear this research from Andre Perry and the Brookings Institute is really astounding. It pairs very well with research we've seen from the Chicago Federal uh, Bank. It also pairs with the Zillow study that shows that in Baltimore, uh, homes that were built in communities that were yellow line, blue line, or green lined in Baltimore's 1937 Baltimore residential security map, um, those homes, the median value for those homes is over 164,000, all three of those communities. But in red line communities, which were where black people were restricted to living, those homes, the median value today is $100,000. And so that's even bigger than the gap that Dr. Perry was saying, 48,000. Here in Baltimore, if you're in a red line community, only 100,000, 164 and up for yellow, blue, and green communities. So in fact, you know, the, the impact of redlining is still with us. And I like to say that you know redlining is not just what banks do. Uh, we know that banks often don't lend in black communities, and in fact, there's a study by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition that shows between 2011 and 2013 here in Baltimore, uh, in the black butterfly, where black people are still concentrated to this day, there's a dearth of lending uh, that you know over twice the amount of lending for homes and small businesses went into the white L, even though white people are only 29% of the population and black people are about 62% of the population. So twice as many loans, even though they're half the population compared to black people. And so this legacy of redlining is sort of compounded by the fact that you have lower home values and you, we still continue to see in black neighborhoods less lending. And the other thing that happens on top of redlining is subpriming. So actually, Black neighborhoods often don't receive loans, but then when they do, there's a surcharge, a higher interest rate being charged. So earlier I said that there's not just private redlining, there's also public redlining. So there's a 2017 study uh, by Stephanie Smith and the Office of Equity in the planning department here in Baltimore that showed that predominantly white neighborhoods receive twice as much from the Baltimore City capital budget compared to predominantly black neighborhoods. So this redlining is actually, you know, is, is compounded by not just banks, it's also our governments that are redlining and disinvesting in black neighborhoods. And so this research uh, speaks volumes in terms of the lost wealth. It actually documents and perform, allows us to actually, you know, put a value to these policies and to quantify it mm -hmm. in a way that we could say $150 billion dollars that black homeowners do not have because their homes are not valued at the same rate as their white counterparts. And that's a huge amount of money. And so it does absolutely tie in with what Ta-Nehisi Coates was saying about the case for reparations. Beyond slavery, that was 150 years ago, there's this racist, predatory housing market that's still extracting wealth from black neighborhoods and black home buyers. Mm -hmm. and Andre, you know, picking up on what Lawrence is discussing here in Baltimore, will you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what other um, economic development strategies could have been created or developed with that $156 billion? 
Yeah, that's a great question. The, um, if you look at the average amount of money that black businesses use to start a business, that $156 billion would have met, uh, would equate to 4.4 million black-owned businesses. If you look at the average cost of a four-year um, degree at a public university, that $156 billion equates to 8.1 million four-year degrees. That that money could have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan, 3,000 times over. It is the essentially the same amount, 97% of the um, damage, the cost of the damage of Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and it goes without saying, that money could have um, gone into um, um, the equity used to, um, to, to, to remodel the home, to move into another neighborhood, to, um, to, to finance, uh, I wouldn't advise it, but to finance a car or a vacation. Um, but more importantly, that, that money could have, should have gone into city government um, so they, they could provide uh, public services in terms of education, um, infrastructure, and other um, services. So it's a, uh, a massive amount of money that's lost. It's the money that people should have used to lift themselves up um, socially. And so what we need to put to bed after um, this report are these notions that black folk are causing their own plight, mm -hmm. that these theories of um, cultural pathology that keep uh, that keeps coming up whenever something happens in the black community. No, we need to really, um, instead of saying um, it all starts at home when there when something goes wrong, we should when people say it all starts at home, it should equate to structural inequality in the United States. Mm -hmm. We see economists uh, Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton's research also uh, dispelling the myth yeah. that black people don't save at the same rates of other races, right? That black people aren't investing in their children's education. I mean, they also say that uh, it's a myth that all of black wealth or, or that black wealth can be um, heavily impacted by owning homes, but they talk about it in the context of all of these other factors, right? They're not, they're not saying that owning a home cannot build wealth. It is that um, people use statements like you just said, Andre, that, well, maybe if they would just buy houses mm -hmm. as if they aren't being prevented from it. Mm -hmm. um, or they would, subprime. Right. When or, they or, do or, do right, it. or getting <laughs> subprime or, or having um, homes flipped on them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. they're vulnerable and they are trying to experience the American dream. Um, Lawrence, will you talk a little bit about what um, policy steps you would recommend for people here on the ground in Baltimore and in other communities like Baltimore? Right. Well, before I get to solutions, I want to say that we should, as we talk about redlining, let's remember that there's green lining taking mm -hmm. place. There's mm -hmm. yellow and blue lining taking place. So there's the advantaging that they're receiving in white communities or whiter communities, uh, lower interest rates, uh, better lending access, better capital access. So they're actually receiving the benefits that are associated with like what Dr. Perry is saying of having a lack of blackness. Mm -hmm. So whiteness is conferring higher values and wealth. So for me, solutions would include um, everything from uh, what I call Baltimore neighborhood reparations, taking 10% of our city budget and allocating that towards the 20 or so top red line black communities in this city and dividing that proportionately to the damage that redlining has done to those communities and allowing a democratically elected racial equity um, you know, disbursement board to actually spend that money in that neighborhood to help undo the damage that has been done by redlining. There's that. I would also suggest what I, uh, the $3 billion racial equity social impact bond because a lot of what redlining has done and I say that redlining is the economic weaponization of racial segregation. Mm -hmm. A lot of what redlining has done is it, it leads to things like lead poisoning mm -hmm. because you don't have the capital to abate the homes uh, from the lead that's in them, the pipes, the soil, the air, the water. And so lead is proliferating in black communities and is damaging the health and the minds of our children. 
to this day. We know it in Flint, but it's also in Baltimore, Chicago, places where there's lots of violence. Well, these, that's one of the impacts of lead poison. It inhibits people's ability to regulate their emotions. So half of the racial equity social impact bond, I suggest, is to get rid of lead mm -hmm. in our environments, in black communities, so that we no longer have this toxic neurotoxin flowing through the bloods and brains of our children. And then you can take maybe 500 billion to address housing, uh, the lack of housing because people aren't able to get these loans to buy homes, mm -hmm. um, and homelessness that is a result of all of this, and the foreclosures and the rental evictions that come from not having this wealth. Um, and then also maybe the one uh, billion that would remain from that. Um, so you said 500 billion just now, 500 million? Oh, I'm sorry, 500 okay. million, yes. yes. Uh, I don't want anybody's out of the three heads billion. to explode. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yeah, the one and a half billion for lead poison, half, well, half a billion or 500 million for housing, and then also maybe the other one billion I would split up for violence prevention programs, substance abuse reduction programs, um, and other things that need to be done, education in black communities as well. So $3 billion here in Baltimore, racial equity, social impact bond, I think would be a fantastic way to go in combination with Baltimore neighborhood reparations also in combination with changing our city budget mm -hmm. so that we're no longer spending over $500 million on the police, which is more than health, housing, arts, parks, civil rights, and job development combined. Mm -hmm. I think that's an apartheid budget. So I would change all those things. Baltimore neighborhood reparations, $3 billion racial equity social impact bond, and also change our apartheid budget to a freedom budget. Great, thank you. Andre, will you talk a little bit about the national level? What kinds of policies is Brookings recommending or are you recommending as a result of this data that we have in front of us? Yeah, I'm going to somewhat punt on that question uh, <laughs> and, and, and actually refer people um, to highlights of an event we just hosted um, here at Brookings um, today on December 5th. Um, and they can refer to um, that video at the, um, the uh, brookings.edu website and look for the devaluation of assets in, in black neighborhoods. Um, you'll be able to find that, that video and it will be posted in a little bit in probably an hour of, of us taping this so folks should be able to, to see it. Um, but um, it, it spotlighted national experts who, who gave um, recommendations to to put flesh on the bones of this research. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Perry, I'm going to leave the final word with you. Any other details or any other points you want to share with our audience? Well, I, I don't want people to to take this report and feel depressed. It, it, actually, I want folks to feel encouraged. Um, first and foremost, what You'll find in the report, again, by going to brookings.edu and look for devaluation of assets in black neighborhoods. You can Google it. You can find it easily. But one of the stats in there is that in black neighborhoods, there's $600 billion worth of housing assets. We have strength. It's just the value. Um, but this report gives people an ability to name their price. Mm -hmm. They see, they can see that their home should be worth more. And they can animate their community, do things and, um, to show and to project that their homes are indeed worth more. And they can take risk on their own homes that they wouldn't necessarily do um, if, um, if, if their homes were actually worth what they are priced. And so I'm, I'm actually encouraged by um, this report in a sense of, yes, we may be devalued, but people can now demand their true price and, and work. Thank you, Dr. Andre Perry, David Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Thank you, Lawrence Brown, uh, Associate Professor at Morgan State University. Hope to have you back. Um, I'm Kalila Harris for The Real News Network. If you enjoyed this story and others like it, consider making a donation at www.therealnews.com donate. Thank you.